Our scripture text for this morning is Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 through 32. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, If we say from heaven, he will ask, Then why didn't you believe in him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We don't know. Then Jesus said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Then he shared this parable with them. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered, but later changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he didn't go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe. So appearances can in truth be deceiving. One would think that this ruling class in Jesus' time with the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees and with all their, their robes and their adornment, that they would be the, the epitome of righteousness and piety and spirituality when in reality they were not. So they challenged Jesus' authority. By what authority do you have this? And Jesus then goes on to talk about John the Baptist. Now, why is that important? Well, John the Baptist did not look anything like the religious leaders and the authorities. He was kind of a wild man from the wilderness, wore leather skins, had an extremely ascetic diet, but he proclaimed boldly to the people of Israel to repent and be baptized. And baptism was a traditional ritual in the Jewish faith in that time, it, but it was a ritual cleansing of oneself. But John was wanting to do a spiritual cleansing of oneself. So he had this, you know, come to the River Jordan and be baptized and repent. But he looked nothing at all like the religious elite. In fact, he probably would not have ever been invited to any event that they ever had together. Jesus as a matter of fact, was in the same area as John the Baptist. Jesus came from a very small town. He did not go to Ivy League schools. He did not have all the trappings. He did not have the wealth. And because Jesus was not like them, they too wondered what authority he had to be able to teach these things and to do these things in the temple. But what Jesus is able to do is this. By the parable he told them in the way that he challenged them in public, he was able to show them that one's authority is not so much in title or in inheritance, but by one's authority comes by the fruits you produce in your life. John the Baptist was not one of them, but obviously he was a very powerful and influential person in that day. And the fruits that he produced was offering hopes of repentance and cleansing and renewal of one's spirituality and to, re to, re to repent and be baptized, and the prostitutes and the tax collectors heard it. They went, they got baptized, and they started changing their lives. But the religious leaders did not. Jesus also shares with them the fruits that he was able to produce. 
that his authority comes from what he was saying and what he was doing and how he was backing it all up. You see, a person can have a position of authority, a person can have a position of leadership, but that doesn't mean necessarily mean that they're leaders. One of my favorite series of all times was produced and filmed by HBO called A Band of Brothers. And what is so cool about this series is that while they were filming it, some of the, of the men who were in Easy Company, the first airborne, who landed behind enemy lines, uh, the, the big invasion and the uh, Allied assault and to end uh, Germany's reign on the world, uh, they were still alive. So you have actual interviews with the people who were the characters in the movie. But... During the Battle of the Bulge, Easy Company's leader that they loved, they would go do anything for him, uh, you know, it was, you know, Lieutenant Winters and Captain Winters, and then he was promoted because he was such an incredible tactician, and the, and the military wanted him in planning and helping them, the logistics and all the different things that they needed. So he was then taken behind the lines, but they replaced him with Lieutenant Dyke. And Lieutenant Dyke was the son of a high-ranking officer, a graduate of West Point, and Lieutenant Dyke was only there because he needed some combat experience before he went on ahead to rise in the ranks. Lieutenant Dyke never, ever engaged with the men. He was never there. Whenever it was times of battle, where's Dyke? Where's their leader? He was always gone. He was always, I need to go, I need to, go to headquarters. Well, Finally, the siege of the Battle of the Bulge was coming to an end, and it was the last offensive of the Allies to, to, to drive the German forces away. And Dyke was to lead Easy Company across this open field that had these huge haystacks, like Monet's haystacks. And he was told, you have to get across the field quickly. You can't delay. Once you start, you run as fast as you can until you can get to this position. Well, Dyke got scared by all the gunfire and the mortars, and he stopped right in the middle of the field. He had his whole company to start, to stop, and they were just sitting ducks out there. Well, unfortunately for Lieutenant Dyke, a mortar found his haystack. After the battle was over, the soldiers of Easy Company found themselves in this old church, and it's a beautiful scene because it's all candlelit inside. The soldiers were getting food. It's the first time they had been indoors <laughs> in weeks. And uh, they were hot coffee to drink. And there was a, a, a girls' choir singing. And it was just angelic. Well, two of the other main characters of the story are Captain Spears and First Sergeant Lipton. And First Sergeant Lipton was gone to Captain Spears talking about his concerns for Easy Company, that they didn't have a leader. He says, quite frankly, we never actually had one. Captain Spears, that, you know, Lieutenant Dyke was an empty suit. He was never there for the men. He never engaged with the men. He didn't care for the men. He was just not there. And then Spears says to First Sergeant Lipton, but First Sergeant Lipton, I heard that there was a, a leader among them the whole time during the siege one who was constantly encouraging them, getting whatever they needed and doing the best he could to provide for them, to make sure they were, they, they were healthy, to make sure that they survived the siege. He was always there, always there as a constant source of encouragement and hope and trying to keep their spirits up. And as he's talking to First Sergeant Lipton, First Sergeant Lipton just looks a bit confused. And Captain Spears says, Sergeant Lipton, you, you don't know who I'm talking about you. I'm sorry, sir, I don't. He says, it was you. It was you, First Sergeant. You were their leader. You were their leader. And oh, by the way, you're not going to be First Sergeant much longer here. You're being promoted to Lieutenant, and you are now in charge of Easy Company. Okay, but I share that story to, 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 to make this point. First Sergeant Limpton did not have the rank. He was not the assigned leader of Easy Company, but he was the leader of Easy Company because he led. He had the fruit of what a leader would be, you see. He led. 
And then Jesus challenges the, 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 the religious authorities then by, with this parable about a father who went to a son, and he said to a son, go into my vineyard and work. And his son said, nope, not going to do it, Dad. And then later he decided to go do it. He went to a second son and said the same thing. I need you to work in my vineyard today. I will do it, Dad. But he never went. And what Jesus was doing is showing the comparison between the two groups. The father in, in the story is God. And the, the first son would be those persons who didn't give God a second thought. Or maybe they did give God a thought, but not a very long one. They did not live spiritual lives or religious lives in any way. But later they got the message and they, got, and they were transformed by that message. And they became something that was crucial for their community and for their people. And they did the work in the vineyard. Whereas the second son is represented by the religious leaders. They were called. They had the position of authority. They had the elite status. And they were told to go and do the work, but they chose not to do the work. So what Jesus is showing in this parable and in this story is that regardless of the credentials we may have, what really defines us and our authority that we have is what we produce. I'm not talking about task. I'm talking about what we contribute to our own lives and our families and the world around us. What are we doing? And what we're doing, is it, is it encouraging people? Is it empowering people? Is it bringing healing to people? Is it bringing people hope? People who had been outcast are now realizing that not only we say they are welcome and they can come in, but indeed when they get here, we treat them like they're welcome. Every church in the world has a welcome, everyone welcome on their sign. But when you go in, if you look different, talk different, act different than what they're normally used to, oftentimes you may not get that also welcome feeling, right? This is the biggest blessing the Windermere Union Church has. Not just for us, but for the world around us. Whoever comes in through that back door is welcome and accepted for who they are. So that's what represents that first son. Some of us grew up in the church all of our lives, and we always know it. Some of us, and, and we're still participating in some, grew up in religious traditions that as soon as they got out of high school and they didn't have to go, they never looked back. But where Jesus' authority comes from is within himself. It comes from the, the realm of God or the kingdom of God as he describes it in the passage. The kingdom of God is like. I want you to, to really, really just allow this seed to be planted deeply within you. The realm of God, the kingdom of God is you. It's your truest self. It's your spiritual self. It's that part of you that is connected to God. But we live in a world where we can be easily distracted. And unless one truly has the focus to look inward, to do the work, to, to do the contemplation, to, to practice the disciplines, then one will not truly know who this Father is. And we may sound like we're being obedient to this Father, but we truly aren't because we're not going out into the vineyards to do the work. Your authority comes from the divine that lives in you. That's where your authority comes from. Some people have the opportunity to go get a higher education or highly skilled and, and be able, and they have certain expertise. But those who have authority are those who act out on their own conscience. John the Baptist was driven to preach repentance and to try to turn things around. Jesus was driven to share good news to all those who had been excluded from the table, to let them know that God had not, God had not disowned them. God did not see them as an abomination. God did not cancel their reservations. The religious leadership did, but because they did doesn't mean that God did, that everybody is welcome to God's table. 
Everybody. And that's why Jesus is telling the religious elite that it will be the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the sinners who enter the kingdom before you because they are open to it. They had a change of heart. They had a change of mind. Their soul, their spirit is being transformed. And they're producing the fruit of one who does that. Whereas the religious leaders were empty vessels. I mean, think about it. When Jesus challenges them in front of everybody... Look at the answer they gave him to his question. John, was his authority from heaven or of human origin? And the story shows us that they go and discuss among themselves. Well, if we say it's of, of heaven, then he's going to ask us, well, why didn't you believe and honor him? Okay. Well, if we say it's of human origin, then the masses are going to rebel against us because they saw him as a true prophet. So there was no answer. They said, we don't know, which was a lie. Why did they have to come back with a lie? Is because who they, the, the, it was an empty vessel. They weren't spiritual leaders. They weren't leaders at all. They had no authority, even though they had all the trappings, because they could not even come up with an answer. And it didn't have to be either or. They could have said, yes, we believe that John's ministry and prophecy was from heaven. And yes, we admit that in the beginning we did not honor it and we did not believe it and we did not trust it. But as we're looking back now, it's starting to make sense. And I'm starting to see that his, you see, it could have been that answer. Or you say, yes, we thought it was of human origin. But when we see the response to John and the changes it made in people's lives, now we are starting to believe. You see, it could have been that too. But what did they do? From their empty shell, they had nothing. They may have all the trappings of authority and leadership, but in reality, they had nothing. Where does our authority come from? Our authority comes from within. Our authority comes from within. When we had our Winter University class last Wednesday night, one of the participants is someone that we know and we love because she is genuinely a div wonderful, wonderful human being. And she made a statement that I just thought was one of the best illustrations of one going to the Bible for spiritual guidance. And she said this, Ruthie said this, she said, you know, back in ancient times, human beings were hunters and gatherers. And when it comes to my spirituality, I find that that's what I am too. I am hunting for these truths. I am hunting for, for, uh, for a deeper relationship with God and myself and those around me. So while I'm hunting, I'm gathering as much information as I can to inform me, to help me to be able to fulfill that desire to know and to be who God wants me to be. I, I, just, I think it's brilliant. I think it's brilliant. You may ask, where did Ruthie go to seminary? She did not. She did not go to seminary anywhere. But you see, seminary education helped me, <laughs> and my education sometimes helps you. But Ruthie discovered that on her own because that which she is seeking comes from the spirit that lives within her, and that is her authority. You see, we can listen to sermons. We can read books, we can go to seminars, we can do workshops. We can gather together at wonderful events and retreats. And all those are tools to help us to look more deeply within ourselves. They're tools. And when I reflect back upon my own life, those sermons that I heard, those books that I read, those seminars that I attended, the ones that were most influential on shaping me and, and helping me to discover my true self weren't so much teaching me something brand new that I never knew, but rather awakening something in me that had always been there. And that's what I find the inward journey does. It helps us to remember what has been there all the time. So many of us think that the, the spiritual quest is, is, is has to be hard and we have to go to some grand mountaintop and talk to some, you know, monk at the top of the mountain and ask, what is the meaning? I want you to know 
that what you're looking for is as obvious as the daylight or the nighttime. It's as obvious as the breath that, and the air that you're breathing. It's there. All you have to do is slow down, take time, and look and seek and hunt and gather so that you might truly connect to that part of you that is your most true and authentic self. The religious leaders in Jesus' story gave nothing because they had nothing to give. They just accepted the trappings and the, and the titles, but they didn't do the work. Whereas Jesus, John the Baptist, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the sinners, they did the work. And they entered the realm of God. They entered the kingdom of God because they're, they have a desire to do so. And they're discovering that with the authority to do that, they also feel empowered to be able not only to change their lives, but to, then to make a difference in the world around them. The Dalai Lama once said, every change of mind is first of all a change of heart. Every change of mind is first of all a change of heart. Heart, soul, spirit. Our authority is the realm of God that dwells in each and every one of us. It is our job to discover that realm and to learn, to grow, and to evolve from it, then the fruit we bear will mirror the person that we've become. Thus ends the lesson. Go in peace and purpose. God bless you all.